I'm, I'm, it's okay. It's on. Uh, we had just um, restarted the live just because the video was super pixelated. So I hope it's better so you can see uh, just a bit clearer. But tonight we are going to be in Psalms 56. If you guys like to open up your Bibles, I'm just going to pray for us again. So if you were in the last live, we're going to pray again. So, Lord, again, we just come before you, Lord, with all the, like, uh, the technical difficulties. I just pray that you take care of those technical difficulties, Lord, um, that's going on with the live feed. And we ask, Lord, that you just uh, set apart this time, Father. We set apart this time for you um, and in, as we spend time in your word. As I said, Lord, please highlight it to us. Father, take away anything that is not of you, Lord, that I have prepared and just put what you have, Father, for your people in front of me. Um, so, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. All is good, Cindy? It's still pixelated, but I'm going to switch Wi-Fi, so just keep talking. Okay. There might be a break in it. There might be a break, just as a forewarning. So, all good? We'll just get... Yeah, just go. Get on. We'll just... All right. So, we're just going to get on started. Technical difficulties, just pray for them, mm -hmm. um, and we'll move on. So... Yes, so we're going through Psalms 56, and this is a Psalm of David, and I absolutely love um, the, the character of David because we have so much of his story from when he was a kid all the way to his old age, and we get to see the areas where he prevailed and failed in life. So um, I love seeing God's grace, uh, God's provision, um, God's hand over his life through all the highs and lows. And so in this uh, psalm, we're going to see a little bit of the lows with the highs. And so without further ado, we're going to start off with the context that the psalm will always give us. You guys are there? 56? Perfect. Um, it always gives us, sometimes not always, gives us context. So with Psalm 56, this is what we get. It says, To the choir master, according to the dove on far off terebinths, a matkim of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. So there's a lot of words there that might not be understandable to the, to the English person, too. Because <laughs> these are uh, Hebrew words. So we get that this that this psalm is directed to the choir master, the one who would go before the maybe thousands of singers and, and be the one to lead them into, into worship, into public worship. And so this is what the psalm is for. It's for public worship, but it didn't come like that. It came... This psalm came out of a real life situation that David went through. And he says, it's according to the dove on a far off terebinth. Terebinth is, is, is a place. It's a far away place. And the dove in this psalm would be David. So if we reread it, it would be David in a far away place. It's, a, it's almost like a very um, metaphorical, um, I, won't, I wouldn't say allegorical, but a really... Um, poetic way of putting on um, David's circumstance. And so I'm just going to touch really briefly, just so you guys can know whenever you're reading your Psalms, this word makim, we actually really don't know 100% what that means. Uh, a lot of scholars have said that this is just an unknown word, and some say that it actually does have a possible meaning of the Hebrew word uh, katham is the way it's pronounced. Um, and what it, what it means to some people, because I, made, I, I really researched it, is that it's an engraving. Yeah, interestingly, that's an engraving. It's an engraving of, of something that um, a song has been uh, labeled as a matkim, uh, as an engraving. And... It is also looked at to be, you know, like a stamped. And another meaning was that it's golden. So 
I went along with this because I really liked what it had to, uh, what the definition would look like, the meaning golden. So the definition was similarly um, assigned to a great value of something. So this psalm could be a a stamped, certified gold um, engraving that this psalm would be. If that makes any sense, it's it's, it's really interesting. So. I hope that gives you kind of a a, um, a idea of what Matt Kim means in engraving of David. And so this is the context that it gives us. When David was seized by the Philistines in Gath. And so we find this is where the story starts of what created the, what um, this would have created this psalm was in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21, uh, verses 10 through 15. And this is um, how the story goes. So you, you guys can flip there, but I'll read it to you guys. And it says this, Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his, ten thousand, his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart, and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands. So David was fleeing Saul. Because Saul was seeking to take his life. And so David is leaving his own place to flee from a friendly enemy to flee to another enemy. And so he's caught in between. He's right in the middle of, of, of getting killed but then going to one of the armies, one of the, one of the lands that, uh, or the, the group of people that the Israelites would frequently fight. And so this is a position he finds himself in, and it's not a very fun position to be in. But that's what he does because he's seeking a place for refuge to be protected in this really horrific event in his life. Um, but one thing before we get started into, into a reading is that, as a way of introduction, one thing that took me a while to learn as a young believer um, the thing that took me a while to learn was that God was always with me. It took me a while to learn that. And one thing that I learned that even when I didn't know God, is that He was with me. Because now when I read in God's Word, I see that He says that He has fashioned my heart. I see that He says that He has knit me in my mother's womb while I was growing. And now that I know God's word, and now that I know that he is always with me, no matter what, no matter the circumstance, I know that I can turn to him at an instant because he's always with me. And David was a man, there was a man who to, defeated the true giant, who took a, a, a lion and a bear and, and slain it as a, as a young boy. And now he's in this area of his life where he's being pursued by, by King Saul. And now he's running to his enemy. And what does he do in the situation? Is in verse 1 is what he does. He says this. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long and attacker oppresses me. And go to verse 2. My enemies trample me trample on me all day long for many attack me proudly the first thing that he does in the situation that he finds himself in it says god i am crying for your help and i need i'm, I'm crying for your kindness in this situation some of your verses your bible translation might say god have like be merciful to me right away turns to god's grace over the situation He's being oppressed by people. He's being uh, taken advantage of. He's in like 
bondage and he's being controlled over because he just doesn't know what to do in the situation but run to his enemies. Run from one enemy to another enemy because he has nowhere to go. But imagine where he was in this situation to, when he wrote this psalm to say, God, be gracious to me. And so he explains the situation. And as I said before in other psalms that we've gone through, is that when you face anything, turn straight to God. And that's what he does. That's the first lesson. Turn to God and explain to him, God is a personal God, explain to him what you are going through. And we'll see why we turn to God. Why we turn to God in these trials that we face in life, just like David. And verse 3 goes on to say, he says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So David wasn't a perfect man. He feared. We all fear. Things. We all fear stuff in life. That's okay. We're not going to be perfect 100%. But he has the courage to say, but I trust in you. To trust is to have a firm belief that something or someone is reliable. Mm. He's saying, God, you, in the midst of this, you are reliable. And I, I, I was asking God, how do I trust you? How do I practically put my trust in you every day? And so we're going to be going through Proverbs 3, 5. And I think this is very important, guys. This is going to be a really good roadmap to say, how can I trust God? And we're going to start off with number one. And I'm going to back it up with scripture, with Proverbs 3, 5. The first thing on how to trust God is do not depend on yourself. Proverbs 3, 5 tells us this, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. What does David do? He doesn't depend on himself of being the man that killed ten thousands. But he depends on God. Number two, number two, how to trust God is cry out to God. Proverbs 3.6 says this. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's what he does, doesn't he? He opens up saying, God, be gracious to me. Number three on how to trust God, run from evil. Proverbs 3, 7 tells us this, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Number four, and this is what we see in David's life. Put God first in your life. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 tells us this, to honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Put God first in your life. That was one thing that David did out of all the things that he ever did. He always put God first. When he fell, when he sinned, put God back as the king in his heart. The next is check yourself. This is another way to trust God is to check yourself by God's word. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is, is deceitful above all things and, and, and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I'm going to go through two more. And I, you guys could have written this down. If not, I'll write it down for you guys and I'll send the two out. Another way to trust God is to listen to the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 tells us this, to guard the deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And the last thing on how you can trust God every single day of your life is to rest in God's love. Proverbs 3, 12 tells us this, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, as a father, the son he delights in. You can rest in God's love. And that is right away in the middle of this trial. David was able to do. When I'm when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In verse 4, it tells us this: 
In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? He is praising something. What is he praising? What is he lifting up? And he's lifting up God's word. What is God's words? God's words are God's promises. When he says it, it's going to be done. And so in the midst of the trial, once again, he's able to say, I trust you. And in that moment, when you put your mind on the things above and not on the things of this earth, you will, you will be able to say, what can man do to me? Absolutely nothing. Because God is the one who created man. He has the power to, to take, take, uh, take your life. He has the power to do anything. And that's why he's able to trust them because he knows that God is all powerful. So we're going to move on to verse 5. So we'll read, yeah, verse 5 and verse 6 we'll read together to go on. All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps, and they have waited for my life. And this is what I notice, guys, is that he doesn't stop to explain to God how terrible the situation is. And that's one thing that I've learned about prayer is prayer is that time to be able to heal and to process and to express to God, Lord, this thing that I'm going through, it's hard and it sucks. It's not easy. He doesn't stop to explain to God. He knows God will take care of him. But when you go before God, one thing that I've learned about prayer is be honest. When you pray to the Lord, He is your Father in heaven. One thing that I love is that Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. So whatever you go through in life, whatever you go through today or tomorrow or next week, be honest before the Lord in the situation. Because David goes on to explain that these people are just going out after him because they just don't, they don't like anything about him. Mm-hmm. They're stirring up strife. They're lurking around to find something to point out and so verse 7 says for their crime will they escape and he says in wrath cast down the peoples O God one thing guys that I've learned in my life is ask the Lord nothing is too big nothing is too small Jesus says in Matthew, you have not because you don't ask. And when you ask, you ask wrongly. I feel as sometimes as Christians, we kind of cower down when an upsetting thing happens, when evil arises. Was not Jesus bold when he would go into Gethsemane and pray fervently to the Lord? He didn't hold back. And... I had a quote, I had like a, 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 a Bible verse here, but I didn't put it down, so we're not going to go to it, or else I'll get distracted. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go off into a rabbit hole. But guys, ask the Lord, as David is asking for God to take vengeance on these people who are wronging him. Don't be afraid to ask God to do the impossible in your life. Nothing is too big. And nothing is too small for him at all. He is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And David recognizes that. I'm going to pose a question to you guys. Do you believe that God will defend you? Just think on that for a second. Do you believe God will defend you? Um, we're going to move on and we're going to read verses 9 and then we're going to stop there. Yes. 
Verse 9. Okay. No, verse 8. I got ahead of myself. Verse 8 and verse 9 will read together. So it says, You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. This is one thing that I've learned about the Lord. In this scripture, in verse 9, and in my life, and in the life of many others, is that God is personal. God is a personal God. Is our faith not based on relationship? Mm -hmm. That's what it is, isn't it? Instead of wallowing in the mud, He points out something so special about our God. He keeps track of His heartaches. So when your heart is heavy and you're laying at night and you are crying and asking the Lord for breakthrough, this is what we learn here is that He knows. He knows. Here's some scripture to back it up for you. Romans 8, verse 26, it says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what ought to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. God is there with you in your tossings. When you're on your bed and you cry, He feels it with you. Here's a, a verse in, in Hebrews, um, I believe it's chapter 2, I didn't write down the address, is this, it's verse 14 through 18, and these words, you know, I love them so dearly much, what the writer Hebrews says, he says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, being Jesus, likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, this is important, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God, to make propitiation for our sins. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. When you are going through rough trials and you are, and you are crying, God understands he was in flesh with us. He knows what it feels like. David's having a personal moment with God. He says, after he says, put my, you have put my tears in your bottle. Mm -hmm. Are they not in your book? Of course they are. And I love how he continues on to say in verse 10 that, well, let me not get ahead of myself. Verse 9, I'm just going to reread it again. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. One verse that I want to remind you guys of is um, is where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What I see in verse 9 is that God fights for us. David declares that his enemies will turn back on the day when he calls upon who? Upon, upon God. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4 says this. For the Lord your God is he 
who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. I'm going to quote one more verse. That God will defend you and fight for you. Exodus 14 verses 13 to 14. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. For the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. The one thing that they had to do was just be still. Mm. That's what David did. In the midst, he could have taken, you know, he was, he was a strong guy. He was an amazing uh, a, like fighter, an amazing soldier. All he had to do was be still. Pray this prayer and say, God, I trust in you. It's all he had to do. You guys can rest in God's promises. We're gonna we're gonna finish off these verses, um, verses ten through. We'll do verses ten through eleven. In God's word I praise in the Lord whose word I praise in God I trust I shall not be afraid what can man do to me did he not just say that in verse 4 in God whose word I praise this is what I say is that you guys can rest in God's promises take them hold on to them memorize them take them to heart Pray them. Ask God to, to come through on these things that he said. But this is one thing that I see, guys, is um, what do we do in response to this amazing love? What do we do? Well, David goes on to say this because he knows that he knows that God will defend him. He says, I must perform my vows to you. This is verse 12. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. Verse 13, For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Guys, what do we do in response to God's promises, to what He's done on the cross, but to offer ourselves to Him? To serve Him with our life and to thank Him every single day. Is that not what He deserves? Mm -hmm. Is that not the logical thing to do is to say, God, You're my everything. All I can give You in response is my life. I must perform my vows to You. It's almost like Romans chapter 12 is to... Uh, is to be a living sacrifice, for that is our reasonable act of worship, to simply give Him our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, everything we have. But He doesn't forget to say, to thank you, to offer thanks to God, because He has delivered Him from not just the... The, the, the situation, but he has delivered his soul. Mm. And this is the point, guys, is that I may walk before God in the light of mm. life. Um, I had another uh, Bible verse here that I wanted to quote, and it was, um, I don't know why it's here. Paul didn't print it. But I will butcher it. But it was where Jesus says, Lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. That's a promise right there. And the thing is, guys, is this. Did the trial that David was facing end right there? No. Didn't change. What changed? His perspective was horizontal, but now his perspective is vertical. He learned that when rocks were being thrown at him, stones were being thrown at him, metaphorically, he wasn't just standing there getting hit. He learned, oh, I could pick up a shield to protect myself. 
we protect ourselves with God's word, God's promises, mm. prayer. Mm -hmm. That's what changed. The circumstance didn't change. Later on it did. We read, we end up reading, you know, that he ends up going back to where he was rightfully supposed to be as king. You can trust in God, guys. And it's not just a flippant thing to say that you can trust God. But you can truly trust God. He is reliable. So cling on to his promises. I encourage you as everybody for the past, I don't know many, how many hundreds and thousands of years has memorized scripture. Memorize his promises. It's like, it's like carrying out like a, a bail like a large sum of money that you can bail someone out of, you can bail yourself out of the of, of the things that happen in life, the heartaches and stuff, by just saying, God, I can trust in you. This words that you have said are worth more than any lump sum of money or any comfort that someone can offer me. You're all I need. So trust the Lord. You can trust God's promises. Lord, I just pray that you remind your people that they can trust in you and that you are reliable. Father God, thank you so much for being with us every single day, every single moment, Father, of life. Not only guiding us through life, but carrying us through it as well. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen.